In the last video, we began to look at the amosamides as an example of the use of small molecules as chemical probes to understand biological processes. Again, as a reminder, you can find this paper from Angevant Chemie in Canvas under Modules. If you look under Modules for the small molecules in chemical biology section, you will find this particular paper by Hughes et al. In the last video, what we talked about was how the amosamide, the portion of the structure that I'm showing right here, circling with my laser pointer, was linked by an amide bond to this group down here, which by itself as an independent individual entity was found previously to fluoresce, enabling its tracking within an organism or within a cell, and also found to be an epitope a structure that is able to bind to a specific antibody. So the thought was by developing this tagged amosamide molecule, where the amosamide has a covalent link to this group that fluoresces and is capable of binding to an antibody, that we could use that property of fluorescence and the epitope properties to track where the amosamide goes within a cell. In other words, what particular molecular target does the amosamide interact with in order to have its observed anti-cancer effect? So in order to dig into that, after the compound was synthesized and its structure confirmed, what next had to happen was that the question had to be raised of whether the compound, amosamide, now that it's tagged with this fluorescent epitopic label, was still able to inhibit cancer cells. For the original amosamide molecule, it was found that the IC50, the concentration of amosamide required for inhibiting 50% of the cancer cells was about 300 nanomolar. Now, a caveat of any chemical probe study that uses a label here, that uses a tag, is that the attachment of that tag may impact the biological activity of the molecule. And so in the case of the amosamides, what had to be done before a detailed study of where this compound goes within a cell is that the tagged amosamide had to be explored for whether it was still biologically active or not. And so the tagged amosamide was subject to the same cancer screening assay as the amosamide. And it was found that the IC50 of the tagged compound increased to 17 micromolar. Micromolar is a larger value than nanomolar. And so that indicated that the tagged amosamide was not as potent because the larger the IC50 value, the more compound that you need to inhibit 50% of the cancer cells. And that refers to a compound that is less potent. So there was a loss of some of the biological activity, but it was dubbed that the compound was still likely effective enough to be tracked within the cell. It was also found in these preliminary works that in addition to the compound fulfilling the criteria of still having some biological activity, so I'll put a green check mark next to that as it checked out in that, the compound was fluorescent when it was put into a plate reader to monitor whether the compound could fluoresce or not. It indeed could. So that was good. That indicated that the capability of it to fluoresce had not been interfered with. And that was not super surprising since this group here is the group that fluoresces and it was still remained intact. Likewise, it was found that the compound was still able to act as an epitope, meaning that it still binds to a specific antibody. In the case of this particular epitope, this particular molecule, the specific antibody that it binds to is an antibody called immunoglobin G. So it's still able to bind to immunoglobin G. So I'll put a check mark next to that as well. So these were the initial checks that suggested that the compound would be suitable to use as a chemical probe. It still had its targeted biological activity and it had these um, properties that were expected to enable its whereabouts within a cell to be tracked down to the level of what individual protein was the compound binding to. So from there, to go a layer deeper into the study of amosamides, what was done was that
the fluorescence of this compound was tracked within a few different cell lines. And so to track the fluorescence within a cell, what they did to track where the fluorescence was within the cell to start localizing and narrowing down where does the compound go within the cell, they envisioned that they could track to the level of the organelle where the fluorescence was located to pinpoint where the amosamides are localizing within the cell or are they spread everywhere within a cell would be the alternative hypothesis there. So in order to tackle this, what they did was they created Petri dishes that contained the cells growing in their media, their nutrient source, in the presence of the tagged amosamide compound. And I'll call that the tagged ammo for the amosamide. After the cells had been incubated with the fluorescence and epitope tagged amosamide, what was done was that images were collected with fluorescence microscopy, where the fluorescence microscopy illustrates where within the cell the um, fluorescence is going and also indicating whether the compound is even able to get into the cell at all. And what was observed by fluorescence microscopy initially can be seen in parts A through D of figure one from the paper, which I'm circling and highlighting here. What you see in blue is the fluorescence of the cells. So what this is indicating, the fact that the cells are glowing in blue after being incubated with amosamide and the background is black, that indicates to us that during this experiment, the cells did accept into the cell the amosamide and that amosamide that was outside of the cell was either washed away or no longer there because it had instead entered the cell. And so that glowing that we see in blue indicates uptake of the tagged amosamide by the cells. So our fluorescent imaging initially indicated uptake of the amosamide, the tagged amosamide by the cells. And the reason why there are multiple panels here is if we look down at the bottom at the description of this for parts A through C, it refers to cells that were incubated with the probe, number four, the tagged amosamide, for 15 minutes, and it used three different types of cell lines to get a broad overview of what's going on. So it used HeLa cells, HCT116, and PC3 cells. The specific names of those cell lines are not important, just recognize that those represent three different types of mammalian cell lines. And then they also did a longer term experiment where they incubated for 12 hours rather than just for 15 minutes. And they show that in part D to illustrate that we still see that the compound is being maintained within the cell. So this told us that the compound enters the cell effectively, even though it's carrying that tag. But then to further localize the compound within the cell, it was necessary to understand exactly where in the cell is the fluorescence coming from. Because although we see these broad ranges of glowing, where is the compound concentrated? Where is it most abundant to get a better idea about what it is targeting? And so what was done then was higher resolution fluorescence imaging in order to closer pinpoint where the fluorescence is coming from. And additionally, the staining of the organelles within the cell in different colors to allow the ability to detect those organelles and superimpose those organelles that have been stained in different colors with the location of the most intense fluorescence. And so that is what we see in parts E through H here is a dual experiment where what was done and monitored was that they superposed high resolution images of fluorescence, where the fluorescence indicates where the amosamide is located within the cell with organelle stains, because there are a variety of stains that can be applied to eukaryotic cell lines 
that will stain specific organelles. Like there's a stain that specifically stains the nucleus and leaves all the other organelles untouched. There's a stain that stains um, lysosomes within a cell. You can stain ribosomes within the cell and other organelles to gain a better idea about what organelle within the cell is the amosomide, the tagged amosomide, most abundant. And what this study revealed was that the superposition of the fluorescence and the organelles that have been stained localized the highest concentration of the fluorescence to this region that I'm circling with my laser pointer here and here. And that corresponded to the position of lysozymes, where the lysozyme is the organelle in the cytoplasm of a eukaryotic cell that contains degradative enzymes. It's thought of as the dumpster for the cell. It's enclosed in its own little membrane and it contains a variety of enzymes that degrade substances within the cell. So what was found was that the tagged amosomide was concentrated within the lysosome of the cells that were explored. And so with understanding that the compounds are localized to the lysosomes, that's the organelle where they are most abundant, then the investigators turned to additionally trying to understand what specific protein that is present there in the lysosome is actually the molecular target of the amosomide. In other words, within that localized area of the lysosome, where is it within the lysosome that the amosomides go? What particular protein are they interacting with within the lysosome? And so to explore that, they carried out an additional series of experiments. So to dig deeper into exactly what the target of the amosomides is, what the experimenters did next was they took the probe, that is the tagged amosomide, our chemical probe, and they mixed it with cell lysates, meaning the cancer cell lines that had been broken open to release a mixture of all the proteins, nucleic acids, and other components from within the cell. So the cell lysate is just our mixture of proteins, nucleic acids, and other biomolecules from within the cell. And then what happened, or what was hypothesized to happen, by mixing our probe with the cell lysate was that it was anticipated that the amosomide would strongly bind to its target. In other words, somewhere within this cell lysate was a protein that was the protein which the amosomide binds to and targets. And so it was hypothesized that mixing the probe with the cell lysate, the probe would come in and bind to its protein target. And so what was anticipated to happen in that binding is that the target protein, the protein that the amosomide interacts with, and I'll put a circle around that, would strongly interact with, and I'm going to put that as a dot dashed line here as our strong interaction. That is not necessarily a covalent interaction. It um, could definitely be by other intermolecular forces instead. Very commonly, compounds that bind to proteins do not bind them covalently, but most commonly they just bind them through electrostatic interactions and other types of intermolecular attraction. So strong interaction was hypothesized to occur between the amosomide and its target protein. And then remember that since the amosomide had been turned into a chemical probe, the amosomide was covalently linked through a covalent bond here, to that group that was fluorescent and also acting as an epitope, a group that would bind to uh, antibody. So what was hypothesized here was that the probe, that is the amosomide that's linked to the fluorescent epitope, would form a strong interaction with the target protein of the cell lysate. And then that particular complex of the target protein with the amosomide and its fluorescent epitope could be fished out of the lysate using an antibody since the antibody will selectively bind to its epitope. So it was anticipated that then 
the complex from above can be fished out of the lysate of many different proteins and other biomolecules using the specific antibody that recognizes the epitope that is part of that tag. So in other words, to draw that out schematically following kind of the same type of schematic that we drew above, we'd have the target protein. Target protein is strongly interacting through this dashed line here with the amosamide. The amosamide is covalently linked, which also is a line there to indicate a covalent linkage to the fluorescent and epitopic tag. The epitope recognizes and very strongly interacts with an antibody. So I'm going to put another dotted line in there to indicate the strong binding of the antibody to its epitope. And then at this end of the line, I'll put the antibody that that epitope recognizes. And so when the cell lysate is poured over a chromatography column that is packed with antibody, what's going to happen is that all of the untagged compounds, all of the untagged proteins, flow right through the column. On the other hand, the antibody is going to selectively capture its epitope and whatever that epitope is strongly associated with. So it's going to ultimately allow us to capture this whole complex ranging from the antibody, which is stationary within the chromatography column, and interacting with the epitope, which is covalent linked to the amosamide, and the amosamide strongly interacting with its target protein, to leave all that bound to the antibody ultimately. So then at that point, what can happen is that by, by eluding this complex from the column, and that can be done by adding an excess of epitope to flush and compete with what's bound here to release it. Ultimately, we can generate the purified target protein. So elute that antibody packed column. And from there, what that will yield is the target protein. in complex with the amosamide and its tag, its fluorescent epitopic tag. And then from there, with a purified protein that is complexed with the amosamide and the epitope, what can be done then is a simple SDS page protein gel to assess the molecular weight and purity of that protein. Once the molecular weight and that purity of the protein are known, then techniques that we learned previously in our omic section and our analytical chemistry section, such as LC with tandem mass spectrometry, can be used to identify the protein. And myosin is a common fibrous protein that is involved in motor coordination of cells. And so by linking myosin to the molecular target of amosamides, it became known that myosin could be a target for cancer chemotherapies because by inhibiting myosin, the cell division of cancer cell lines was inhibited. And then to further investigate this, what the team did to provide an additional layer of evidence for the binding of amosamide to myosin was that the group took and created a molecular model of myosin where the amosamide molecule is docked in the structure of myosin. So what we see here in this image is the result of those so-called docking studies where the experimenters computationally overlaid the known x-ray crystal structure of myosin with the chemical structure of the tagged amosamide. And what we see is in gray are depicted schematically the portions of the protein and the small molecule, the amosamide that's been tagged is shown in this turquoise and it's shown 
computationally where the myosin interacts with the amosamide and specifically what individual amino acid residues were involved in that interaction to provide further evidence and confirmation of the experimental observation that the tagged amosamide indeed interacted with myosin. It was seen that there's this very tight, very strong fit of the binding pocket of myosin with the amosamide molecule of which is shown here in the highlighted region as that deep binding pocket. And then the fluorescent part is what's hanging off right here. So that provided additional confirmation of the biological target of the amosamides. So as take homes here, what we have seen is an example of going from an initial biomolecule, amosamide, for which the biological target of that molecule was not known, and using that as a chemical probe by derivatizing it with a fluorescent epitopic group in order to track where it ends up going within a cell. And that led to an increased understanding of myosin and its role in cancer cells and in the structuring of the cytoskeleton. And so by understanding this, um, what was determined was where the amosamide binds and increased understanding of the process of cancer development and new opportunities for strategies to inhibit cancer.